Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody tuning in from all around the world. My name is Laura McKay from the Doherty Institute at Melbourne in Australia. And on behalf of the 2023 Global Immunotalk organizers, we've put together a program to take us through till the end of the year. We've got a really exciting lineup. And today's extra special, it gives me incredible pleasure to introduce today's Global Immuno speaker, Dr. Laura Hooper from the University of Texas Southwestern who um, will be well known to so many of our listeners um, tuning in for her renowned work um, on interactions between the host and the microbiome. Now, just a little bit about Dr. Hooper. She was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, before training at the University of Washington in St. Louis, and then um, taking on her postdoctoral training with Jeffrey Gordon. She then joined the faculty of the Department of Immunology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, where she now acts as chair. She is also a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences and also the National Academy of Medicine. Now, Dr. Huber has made so many seminal discoveries in learning all about our interactions between the host physiology, the microbiome, metabolism, circadian rhythm, super high impactful journals such as Cell Nature and Science and so many discoveries which have really shaped our understanding of this topic which now so many others have followed suit and now working on. Um, Laura we're so happy that you've joined us here today and we're also so grateful of all the trainees that you've um, been training and mentoring um, over the years and also in your role as chair and just to get to know you a little bit better we'd love to ask you a question to hear a little bit more about your journey. And so the question that we'd really like to ask you is, could you share one of the most impactful decisions that you've made, which has really helped shape your scientific career? Um, thank you so much, Laura. Um, again, I, I really appreciate being invited to, to this forum. So to answer your question, uh, I think, you know, the most impactful, uh, the, the, decision that I think most impacted my career was my decision of where to do my postdoctoral training. Um, so, you know, the microbiome field has exploded in the last 25 years. And um, I made the decision early on before microbiome was, was fashionable to join uh, Jeffrey Gordon's lab uh, at Washington University in St. Louis for my postdoc. And that was impactful in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, I was just lucky, plain old lucky, to be at the beginning of a really great field, and second of all, to um, have the opportunity to be mentored uh, by such a, a great mentor, um, uh, which, which Jeff was and still is. Oh, that's really fantastic to hear. It's great to hear, you know, the um, taking the risk. Of course, you know, there's luck involved, but having the great mentor and making it work, that's um, really fantastic advice, I'm sure, for all our grad students listening who are thinking about what steps to next take. Laura, we're so excited again for your presentation. If you could share your slides with us. Um, yes. That's fantastic. And um, take, it, take it away. All right. Um, thank you again for this opportunity to uh, present in this forum. I, I really um, appreciate it. And um, as Laura pointed out, I've been, uh, I'm in the microbiome field. I have been for uh, more than uh, 25 years now. And um, most of the, the work from my lab has been in the, uh, the microbiome arena. And what really what has um, transpired is that the, the microbiome has led us um, because we followed the science, it has led us into all kinds of areas that uh, we wouldn't have predicted. As Laura mentioned, we worked on the circad we worked on aspects of uh, circadian biology in the gut. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today actually is how the microbiome has taken us into the realm of vitamin A and how this essential vitamin uh, uh, impacts the immune system, particularly the immune system in the gut. And again, it's not an area I would have expected uh, to, to be working in. So we all know um, that vitamin A is important. You're, you're told to eat your vegetables and get eat vitamin A rich foods. So why is this? Um, well, vitamin A is important for a lot of physiological uh, um, 
uh, aspects of, of human physiology, but in particular, it's particularly important for immunity. So um, when you eat vitamin A rich foods, um, these are uh, um, absorbed uh, in the intestine and converted to a vitamin A derivative called retinol that'll be at the center of a lot of what I'm going to talk about. Um, this gets uh, mobilized um, to immune cells, and I'm going to talk a lot about mechanisms by which this happens, which is um, part of what we've discovered uh, in, our, in our studies over the last few years. Um, and this, of course, fosters resistance to um, infections with microorganisms, either bacteria or viruses. So uh, we, we haven't known, what we haven't known uh, um, in the in our understanding of vitamin A is how uh, vitamin A and its derivative retinol are mobilized to immune cells. And so that's um, the particular discovery that I'm going to talk about and how the microbiome uh, impacts this process. So how is vitamin A delivered to the immune system? So as I said, we work in the arena of the microbiome, in particular, the gut microbiome. Um, and so all of you on this call are colonized with an insane number of bacteria. Um, there are more than 100 trillion bacteria in the intestines of, of the average human. Uh, most of these are uh, symbiotic organisms. They don't cause disease, um, but they are uh, uh, very well integrated into our physiology. And indeed, our, our gut microbiome is essential for how our immune system develops, in particular, the gut immune system. But we haven't understood uh, very well the mechanisms that underlie this. So how do our gut bacteria communicate um, with our innate immune system, with our adaptive immune system? And this is where uh, the vitamin A story comes into play. So... Um, so the question of how intestinal bacteria regulate immune system development, particularly uh, in, the, in the case of gut immunity, um, just hasn't been very well understood. Um, so to, I'm going to sort of uh, show my, my hand here in terms of the mechanism that I'm, I'm going to talk about in this talk. Um, what I'm going to uh, talk about is our discovery that the microbiota induces the expression of vitamin A binding proteins. These are actually retinol binding proteins that are made in the intestine, in the intestinal epithelium in particular. These bind retinol and transport retinol from uh, gut epithelial cells into uh, deeper into uh, the gut tissues and transfer it to um, the immune system. So there's a flow of retinol from the diet to the epithelium and into immune cells that is regulated by the microbiota through these retinol binding proteins. So this is the process that I'm going to talk about, and, it, and we think that it underpins how the microbiome shapes adaptive immunity in the gut. So, um, so my lab has actually focused for many, many years on a particular set of cells that are uh, part of the intestine. These are my absolute favorite cell type in the universe. Um, and these are the epithelial cells that, that uh, line the entire surface of the intestine. So this is a, a very nice schematic diagram that was published um, a couple of decades ago, showing uh, very nicely uh, the, the single layer of epithelial cells that um, is on the surface of, of uh, our small intestine. This is actually a depiction of the small intestine, but there, there's something similar in your colon, your large intestine. And so this epithelium is extremely important because it's an interface not only with the diet um, and absorbs components of the diet, such as vitamin A, but also in, it interfaces with this vast microbiome that, that lives in your gut. So these two environmental signals are really uh, well integrated by the epithelium, and, and uh, the epithelium can use this information then to uh, communicate with the underlying adaptive immune system and telling it how to develop um, in response to uh, various in environmental signals, including infection, um, changes in the microbiome, et cetera. Um, so this is where we started. Um, and when I started my lab 20 years ago, I, it's, it's hard to, to believe this now, but we knew um, actually virtually nothing about how the epithelium responds to um, this vast microbiome that lives in the in the gut lumen. So one of the first things that uh, we did in my lab to set about 
um, trying to understand um, this interaction between the microbiome and epithelial cells was to do a transcriptomics uh, survey of what happens when you uh, colonize a germ-free mouse with a microbiome. How does the, how does the how do the epithelial cells respond? So, so germ-free mice are mice that are completely devoid of um, any microorganisms, including uh, bacteria um, and fungi. Um, there are some viruses, but but these are, are generally uh, because there are some viruses that are integrated into uh, in the the mouse genome, as is true in humans as well, um, that we can't get rid of. But by and large, these are completely devoid of of contact with the microbial world. So what happens when we look when we compare epithelial cells from germ-free and conventionally raised mice that have a microbiome. So this was, keep in mind, this was 2003, 2004. So we were using um, old fashioned methods of uh, to do these global transcriptional surveys and we have much uh, better methods now, but we were using Affymetrix DNA microarrays at the time. Um, so we did a comparison uh, between, um, in comparison, a comparison of the transcripts that were in conventional mice versus germ-free mice uh, epithelial cells and came up with a list of 200 genes. And that was a great list. And that has actually, that list has actually driven most of the discoveries in my lab over the last 20 years. So I thought it was a really expensive experiment at the time, um, but it turns out it was a good investment. So a lot of what my lab has uncovered has been transcriptional changes that occur in gut epithelial cells in response to the microbiome. And among these are um, uh, increases in the expression of a number of different antibacterial proteins. So these are protein antibiotics that are made abundantly by epithelial cells. Um, and you can imagine why they would want to do that. I mean, there are a hundred trillion bacteria in the gut. And although they are uh, you know, in, in some sense, our friends, we need to keep them uh, uh, in their place. And so these proteins are secreted into um, a mucus layer that covers the entire surface of the gut. Um, it's kind of like little landmines that keep, uh, keep these bacteria from these friendly, otherwise friendly bacteria from invading our tissues. So this told us that the microbiome is really important for shaping uh, gut, adapt, uh, gut innate immunity, but we didn't know anything for a long time about how the microbiome shapes gut adaptive immunity. Um, and uh, what sort of got us down the road was another uh, um, set of genes encoding uh, proteins that we uh, found from these microarrays were regulated by the microbiome. And these are the sort of the hero of the story that I'm gonna tell. These are the serum amyloid A proteins and their genes um, were represented in this microarray experiment. And we saw that they were induced um, by the microbiota. Um, so this is a Q uh, PCR, a real-time PCR experiment um, that we did to verify the results of our microarray experiment. Um, so we're looking at gene expression in the mouse small intestine under three different conditions. Um, the first condition is uh, in germ-free mice. Uh, the other condition is conventionally raised mice, um, which have a microbiome. And then we can take conventionally raised mice and treat them with antibiotics and, and sort of reduce the density of this microbiome. So you can clearly see, if we look here at serum amyloid A1, the gene encoding serum amyloid A1, you can see that there's expression in the in the conventional mice, but not in germ-free and not when uh, you treat with antibiotics. And we see something similar with SAA2 um, and SAA3. So clearly intestinal uh, regulation of the genes encoding intestinal SAAs um, is uh, um, through the microbiota, which induces their expression. Um, so we wanted to get to know more about what serum amyloid A proteins might be doing and why they might be responding to the, the microbiome in, in terms of uh, inducing their expression. Um, so we know that uh, serum amyloid A proteins are produced predominantly in two tissues. The first one is the intestine, as I've just shown you. Um, and I should mention that um, there has been a lot of really nice work from Dan Lippman's lab at NYU showing that uh, this epithelial cell serum amyloid A promotes the production 
of IL-17 by TH-17 cells. I'm going to tell a slightly different story about what SAAs are doing, but um, I want to acknowledge their work because I think this is really important insight into what um, SAAs might be doing, uh, are doing um, in terms of, of promoting um, immune system function. The other place that you see SAA expression um, is in the liver. So you only see SAA uh, expression um, in the liver when there's an infection. So normally if an animal or human isn't infected, you won't detect SAA in the liver or in the circulation. So typically during an infection, um, you get a very acute upregulation of uh, serum amyloid A expression. It gets dumped in massive quantities into the circulation, um, and then it, it quickly goes away as the infection is cleared. Um, but so the question is, what is, it, what is it doing in the intestine? What is it doing in the circulation? Um, and why is the liver dumping it into the circulation during infection? So... Um, so we didn't know the answer to these questions, but we started to get some insight into uh, the biochemical function of SAA when we realized that its expression requires dietary vitamin A. So um, this is a, a very simple um, immunofluorescence analysis of serum amyloid A expression in the mouse uh, small intestine, these top two panels. We did this experiment um, by putting mice on either a vitamin A deficient diet, so we've deprived them of vitamin A, um, and compared them to uh, controls that have a vitamin A replete diet. And you can see, so the, reds, the red color here is where SAA is expressed. So this is just a, a section through mouse small intestinal tissue, and you can see the epithelium that, again, um, covers the entire surface of the intestine. It's lighting up for SAA expression. Similarly, at the other side of SAA expression, you see uh, a similar dependence on dietary vitamin A. So in the liver, um, liver cells that express SAA will only express, uh, express it if there's vitamin A in the diet. Um, expression is much lower um, in a vitamin A, in animals fed a vitamin A deficient diet. So this told us that SAA is, is responsive um, to the presence of vitamin A. And we started to therefore wonder if it might itself be a protein that is involved in somehow in vitamin A metabolism or transport. Um, so uh, um, another, another uh, set of molecular studies that we did was to look at the mechanism by which SAAs are regulated by vitamin A. So again, vitamin A comes in through the diet. So if you eat a bunch of carrots, you're getting a lot of vitamin A. Um, it's a, the, the beta carotene and these carrots is absorbed by epithelial cells cleaved in half uh, to generate retinol. Um, and ultimately the sort of the bioactive form of retinol is retinoic acid. So this is just an enzymatic derivative of retinol. And the reason that's important is because there are uh, transcription factors made by um, many cells in the body that express retinoic acid receptors. There are three, um, alpha, beta, and gamma. And what we found is that if we deleted retinoic acid receptor beta, which binds to retinoic acid and regulates gene transcription, um, <coughs> excuse me, if we delete the gene encoding uh, RER beta in um, gut epithelial cells, we don't see SAA expression. And we did, um, I'm not gonna show you the data, but um, what we did find is that this is due to a direct binding interaction between RER beta, retinoic acid receptor beta, and the promoters, the promoters of, the, of these SAA genes. Um, so RER beta binds to retinoic acid and um, promotes the expression of the SAA gene. So this is how you get vitamin A um, dependence of these genes. So, um, so what, it, what could SAAs be doing that might be relevant to vitamin A metabolism or transport? So we looked um, at the SAA uh, um, protein sequence. We noticed that it was very hydrophobic and we reasoned that, and you can, I'll back up a slide. You can see uh, many of you might recognize th that this chemical structure indicates um, uh, that that retinol, this derivative of vitamin A, is very lipid-like, so it's very hydrophobic. 
Um, and because SAAs are themselves hydrophobic, we thought maybe they bind uh, retinol or some derivative of vitamin A. So we did a series of very careful biochemical uh, studies to um, see if this was true. And so I'm just showing you one here. So here, what we've done is we've expressed excuse me, recombinant uh, mouse SAA1. So this is one of the three uh, mouse um, SAA proteins. And we've um, titrated in some uh, retinol and we are assaying for retinol binding by reading out fluorescence. And you can see we get a nice binding curve and we can extract a binding affinity of a binding a constant of 170 nanomolar. So this is reasonably tight binding and um, agrees with the uh, binding constants of other known retinol binding proteins. Um, we got similar results when we expressed other recombinant mouse and human SAAs. So this suggested that human and mouse SAAs are retinol binding proteins. Um, they bind retinol. Um, that doesn't really tell us a lot about where they're taking the retinol, which is something um, I'm going to address um, a little bit further down the road here. So we also saw, in addition to doing these biochemical studies, we did structural studies um, to that sort of solidified this idea that SAAs bind with retinol. Um, so here's a, a crystal structure um, of a mouse, uh, uh, sorry, human SAA3, um, which is uh, complex with retinol. So this is um, it turned out when we did the crystal structure that there are three molecules of SAA3, which are required um, to form this complex with retinol. This is the monomer, um, and uh, but in um, but you uh, these monomers assemble into a trimeric uh, complex, a homotrimer, where retinol, again, this lipid-like um, uh, molecule is binding to a hydrophobic uh, pore that's created by um, the trimerization of these uh, monomers. So this is how you um, how a, a relatively small protein such as SAA3 um, can form a hydrophobic uh, uh, binding pocket that can accommodate retinol. So, um, so these are retinol binding proteins but uh, it, in vitro, but are they binding retinol in vivo? So this is where we sort of hit a wall for a couple of years, actually. So we're gut people. So we were trying to, what we were trying to do is be good biochemists and isolate SAAs from the gut and show by mass spectrometry that they are bound to um, retinol. And this was virtually impossible for us to do because come to find out the gut is, a, is an organ that really likes to uh, digest proteins. So we had a lot of, of problems with um, protease activity that inhibited our ability to do this. So luckily we, we knew, as I pointed out earlier, that SAAs are dumped in huge quantities into the serum uh, from the liver um, during a, an acute systemic infection. So we decided to leverage this to try to show that uh, whether it determine whether SAAs in vivo are actually bound to retinol. So here we IP injected. So we've intraperitoneally injected a mouse with salmonella typhimerium. So this is a bacterial pathogen that we can in, uh, in, inject into mice and we'll see uh, a very acute um, response in the liver, including upregulation of serum amyloid A. It appears in the serum in, in, in large quantities, and we can isolate it as part of high-density lipoprotein complexes by um, uh, size exclusion chromatography. And then we performed um, liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry to uh, determine if there was retinol uh, uh, present in these complexes. And so you can see these um, LC-MS-MS traces here, um, and we got a retinol signal indeed in wild-type mice, in serum from wild-type mice, but when we infected it, similarly um, mice that are lacking SAAs um, in the liver, uh, we don't see a signal. So this was good evidence that SAAs might be uh, associated with retinol in vivo. Um, and again, we didn't really know where SAAs were taking retinol or really what they were doing, but we thought that probably 
uh, because they are so uh, acutely responsive to infection that they might have an immune function. And this idea was supported um, by an experiment where we uh, in injected mice with Salmonella typhimurium again to, to give an acute systemic infection. Um, and what we assayed for was dissemination of these salmonella bacteria to the liver. And you can see that the livers from the SAA knockout mice have a higher bacterial burden than do the livers of wild type mice. Again, supporting the idea that serum amyloidase um, uh, may have something to do with, with uh, resistance to salmonella infection. Um, and we see a similar thing when we look at bacterial burdens in the spleen. Okay, so what we knew at this point is that serum amyloidase are retinol binding proteins that circulate retinol, retinol during infection. So um, when you get an acute infection um, systemically, this induces an acute phase response in the liver. Um, and one of the things in this acute phase response is serum amyloid A. We knew that it was uh, likely bound to retinol in the circulation soon, soon after the infection was detected. What's interesting and what was puzzling at the time about this is that the liver is well known to make another retinol binding protein um, called very uh, sort of a plain vanilla um, a name for a protein, but it's called retinol binding protein as if the people naming it thought it might be the only one. So um, when the, the puzzling thing for a long time was that when you get a, an acute bacterial infection, such as the salmonella infection that we're using, this retinol binding protein, um, which has been studied for a long time, actually goes away. So its expression uh, precipitously decreases. Um, but we had found that at the same time that this other retinol binding protein, serum amyloid A, is turned up, um, and it also is bound to retinol. So this suggested that at least when you um, uh, when thinking about what's going on in the liver during acute in, uh, an acute infection is that retinol is rerouted by serum amyloid A during infection. So you have this downregulation of one retinol binding protein and an upregulation of another. So all of this was really interesting, but very mysterious because we still didn't know where the serum amyloid A was taking uh, the retinol. Where is it going? And um, is it actually doing anything to the immune system? So at this point, we went back to uh, what we do best, which is to work in the gut. Um, and we started to ask questions about where the serum amyloid A retinol complex is being targeted in the gut. Is there a receptor for um, SAA retinol complexes? Um, and the general question of, S of do SAAs also mobilize uh, retinol in the intestine as they do um, uh, in the liver? So um, vitamin A is, um, has long been known to be essential for intestinal adaptive immunity. So again, vitamin A comes in through the diet. Um, it's absorbed um, as beta carotene, uh, for example, from carrots. Um, it's a, this beta carotene is absorbed by gut epithelial cells um, and converted to retinol. And this retinol um, is very important for a couple of uh, different aspects of uh, intestinal adaptive immunity. In particular, it's really important for imprinting gut homing receptors on, um, on CD4 positive T cells. This is just a subset of T cells um, that induces them to home from lymph nodes to the intestine. So if you don't have vitamin A, you really won't have very many CD4 positive T cells in your intestine. It's also really Im important for uh, inducing the production of the primary immunoglobulin uh, in the gut, which is immunoglobulin A. So IgA producing plasma cells, which are derived from B cells, um, uh, develop uh, um, in the presence of dietary vitamin A, but not very well without. So um, again, you don't really have much adaptive immunity in the gut if you don't have adequate vitamin A. But again, it's it wasn't clear how vitamin A is actually being mobilized to the immune system. So, um, so at this point, I had recruited a really talented postdoc to my lab uh, named uh, Yeji Bong. She was from South Korea, and she was an outstanding uh, biochemist and immunologist, which was perfect for this, um, this project. And she decided to figure out 
in the gut, where are where are serum amyloid A's taking their bound retinol? Um, and she came up with a very interesting uh, series of discoveries. So first of all, she looked um, at, uh, this is looking at SAA expression in the small intestines of mice versus the expression of retinol binding protein four, which is actually the, the predominant um, retinol binding protein isoform uh, in mice. So again, this is um, this uh, retinol binding protein that is downregulated by the liver during infection, which again is, is kind of confusing um, uh, uh, given the need for the, the big need for retinol during an infection. So what she saw is that um, SAA1 is uh, more highly expressed in uh, the intestine than is RBP4. So it's the major retinol binding protein um, in the small intestines of mice, not RBP4. Um, conversely, in the liver, you see much higher expression of RBP than SAA. And this, of course, is, is um, under uninfected conditions. Um, you can see this at, at a protein level here. This is just a Western blot showing uh, the protein levels of both SAA um, and um, RBP4. So um, SAA is in the intestine, not really RBP4. So this suggested it's doing something important. Let's see if I can advance my slide. There we go. So SAA is there. It's the predominant retinol binding protein. Does it have a receptor? So she decided to go receptor hunting because we thought, if we can identify a receptor, first of all, we'll have the beginning of a mechanism. And second of all, we can then go hunting for this receptor in various cells, and this might give us an idea of where SAA is targeting its retinol. So she devised a really clever strategy for this. Um, again, she was a fabulous biochemist. And uh, what she uh, did was to um, use a, a bireactive um, crosslinker. So she expressed SAA, recombinant SAA, as a his-tagged protein. She add, added her bifunctional crosslinker uh, to um, her SAA and then uh, loaded it with retinol. So this SAA loaded with retinol and attached to the, the crosslinker was added to adipocytes. So you might ask, why adipocytes? This kind of comes out of left field at this point, but she had assayed a number of different cell lines for evidence of saturable SAA retinol binding and adipocytes happen to have uh, this signature of, um, of a possible um, SAA receptor. So she used them for her biochemistry. So she added uh, her crosslink uh, protein plus crosslinker, um, hit it with UV light because it's a, a photoreactive crosslinker. And then this in theory will um, uh, cross-link um, SAA to uh, possible receptors. So she separated these out on an SDS page gel and then probed for where SAA is. So now SAA is about a 10 kilodalton protein. You can see though, it lights up here way above the 250 uh, kilodalton marker. So this suggested it was um, now associated with a very high molecular weight protein. So she uh, cut that band out and, and sent it for mass spec analysis. And what came back was that um, SAA was associated with low density lipoprotein receptor related protein one. It's kind of a mouthful, um, uh, but it's abbreviated as LRP1. So this actually made a lot of sense. This is a, a very large transmembrane protein that belongs to the LDL receptor family. Um, low density lipoprotein receptor, which is of course Im important in um, cholesterol homeostasis. So it's an endocytic receptor um, and it has many known ligands, uh, many of which are actually lipoproteins. And you can kind of think of SAA uh, retinol complexes as lip uh, lipoproteins because as I pointed out before, retinol is, is lipid-like. So she had a, a receptor candidate. So she went in and did careful biochemistry to uh, um, convince herself that um, there was actually tight and specific binding between SAA and LRP1. And this is um, an assay that she did using microscale thermophoresis, um, titrating SAA, uh, recombinant SAA into recombinant uh, LRP1 and reading out uh, binding, and she could extract a binding affinity of about 33 nanomolar. So this is pretty tight binding between SAA and, um, and uh, LRP1. And again, 
uh, the, the KD is actually similar to that of RBP and its um, receptor. So we thought uh, that this um, was promising. So she then moved on to cell, bio uh, cell biology assays, um, looking at LRP1, uh, a binding of SAA to LRP1. So in, um, in one assay she did, she used cultured fibroblasts that either express LRP1 or don't. So they um, either have a genetic deletion of LRP1 or they express it. And she titrated in SAA and looked for uh, binding of SAA using an antibody and flow cytometry. And you can see that the LRP1, uh, the cells that lack LRP1 bind less SAA on their surfaces. Then she, she asked the question of whether SAA facilitates um, retinol uptake into these cells in an LRP1 dependent manner. So here what she did was to preload her recombinant SAA with tritiated retinol. So she's using a radioactive retinol tracer. And she asked whether um, she sees more uh, uptake of this tracer in LRP1 uh, negative versus LRP1 positive uh, fibroblasts. And you can see here that there's more uptake in the, the uh, cells that express LRP1. Um, we do still see some uptake uh, in uh, saturable uptake in uh, cells that don't express LRP1, which suggests that there may be another receptor lurking in there somewhere, but we haven't characterized that one yet. Okay, so, so this was biochemical and cell biological evidence for an interaction between um, SAA and um, LRP1, which appeared to be important for, um, for retinol uptake by cells. So going back to uh, the intestines of mice, um, she decided to use this receptor to go hunting for cells that uh, might interact with SAA and might take up um, uh, this bound retinol. So she did a, a first a kind of a really simple sort. She looked uh, at epithelial cells in the gut uh, versus um, the gamish of immune cells that resides below the epithelium. We usually just call this the lamina propria, and it's a lot of different cells, B cells, T cells, uh, dendritic cells, um, uh, monocytes, and so forth. It's a lot of different kinds of cells. And what she saw is that there was more um, LRP1 expression in the lamina propria than in the epithelium. Um, and when she looked at this further by flow cytometry, what she saw is that LRP1 is predominantly expressed on myeloid cells, and in particular ones marked with a marker CD11C. Not so important what that does, but it's just a marker for myeloid cells. Myeloid cells in, uh, encompass both dendritic cells and macrophages, and what these cells are really good at is are kind of uh, going around, at least in the gut, beneath the gut epithelium and sampling whether um, anything has, has sort of broken through any bacteria, any viruses um, that have gotten through the, the epithelial barrier. And, it, and they will take this information and go to the lymph nodes and um, uh, tell T cells and B cells to um, develop into functional immune cells that can deal with this infection. So um, this, these cells are the ones that are expressing LRP1. What's really interesting about myeloid cells, in addition to this sort of intermediary uh, uh, function that they serve in, in the immune system, is that these cells are essential for vitamin A dependent adaptive immunity in the gut. So um, again, as I, as I told you, vitamin A uh, is absorbed by epithelial cells and converted to retinol, and we had discovered that SAAs are retinol binding proteins made by epithelial cells. And um, it turns out that myeloid cells need a source of retinol, because what they do is they convert this retinol enzymatically using a couple of different enzymes into retinoic acid, which again is this functional form of retinol that binds to retinoic acid receptors and can uh, um, regulate transcription. So, um, and, and these myeloid cells are essential uh, for adaptive immunity because they uh, transfer this retinoic acid to T and B cells and the RARs, the retinoic acid receptors in T and B cells, bind this retinoic acid and start to express a lot of different genes that are involved 
in developing into functional immune cells. So, um, so again, these myeloid cells are essential for vitamin A dependent adaptive immunity. So we were super excited when we saw that they also express LRP1 because we didn't know before that, how, how do these cells get their retinol? How do they get it from uh, the diet and from epithelial cells? And so we hypothesized that maybe LRP1, this LRP1 that's expressed on them is part of the answer to that question. So how do these myeloid cells acquire retinol for conversion to retinoic acid? So what Yeji did, did next was to uh, do a series of mouse experiments to test this hypothesis. Um, so first of all, she generated uh, knockout mice um, that lack all of the uh, four isoforms of SAAs in mice. So mice actually uh, have four um, uh, gene, SAA genes in their genome. And so that's the SAA side. She also made a knockout mouse on the LRP1 receptor side. So these mice lacked, she engineered them to lack LRP1 specifically in their myeloid cells. They're present everywhere else in the body. So when she looked at these mice uh, functionally, so the assay she did first was to feed the mice tritiated retinol. So again, she's using this uh, radioactive tracer and then assaying how much radioactivity is actually getting into these CD11C positive myeloid cells. And you can see that there's less uh, tritium in the uh, myeloid cells from SAA knockout mice and from these LRP1 uh, deficient mice. Um, she also looked at uh, readouts of retinoic acid production um, because if if you don't have enough, uh, if these cells are lacking in, in uh, acquiring retinol, they're not going to be able to generate uh, this retinoic acid that is so essential for uh, promoting adaptive immunity. And so here she's reading out the expression of an enzyme um, called RD, uh, RALDH um, that's important for generating retinoic acid. And you can see, again, she sees less RALDH activity in her SAA knockout mice and in her L LRP1 uh, knockout mice. So what, the, what this tells us is that SAA and LRP1 both promote retinol uptake by intestinal uh, myeloid cells, and they're important for the capacity to produce retinoic acid. Sorry, this is a little, I went backwards. <laughs> there we go. Um, so does this actually impact vitamin A dependent intestinal immunity? So as I mentioned uh, early on in my talk, one of the hallmarks of vitamin A dependent intestinal immunity is um, IgA production. Um, so you can see that the SAA knockout mice make uh, less, um, have fewer um, IgA producing B cells. Um, and uh, in their SAA, not, uh, the SAA knockout mice have fewer uh, IgA producing B cells. And this is also true for the LRP1 um, deficient mice. There's also impaired CD4 positive T cell homing. So recall that another hallmark of vitamin A dependent immunity is uh, imprinting gut homing receptors on T cells. So this is part of the developmental program um, that's elicited in T cells in the lymph nodes um, telling them to home back to the intestine and deal with an infection. So you can see that these uh, there are fewer CD4 positive T cells in the guts of SAA knockout mice. And this is also true uh, when she looked at um, LRP1 deficient mice. So these two hallmarks of vitamin A dependent immunity are lessened in, um, in mice that either don't have SAA or don't have the LRP1 receptor. So what does this mean for the ability of mice to fight a bacterial, an actual bacterial infection? Um, so because this is an adaptive immune, so because the um, SAA and LRP1 are promoting an adaptive immune response, what, what Yeji did was to um, essentially immunize mice and then see if later on they were more or less able to fight uh, uh, a live infection. So what she did was she immunized mice with heat killed salmonella. So this, you can think of this as a kind of a, a vaccine. Um, and then she, uh, so she had to knock down the microbiota to do this, which is why she recolonized here and then came back 28 days later and infected with live salmonella typhimerium. So again, this is a, a gut 
a pathogen, she's immunized using the heat killed version and then come back with live. And then she's uh, she checked for two things. First of all, she looked to see if there was a salmonella specific IgA response. So if she did this immunization protocol in SAA knockout mice at 28 days, she saw a lowered um, IgA response to salmonella. And similarly, she saw uh, the same thing in um, the uh, LRP1 deficient mice. More importantly, uh, these mice um, had were less able to survive the infection. So if you look at SAA knockout mice um, and their ability to survive this later salmonella uh, infection after immunization, you can see that the SAA knockout mice are more susceptible. Um, and again, similarly, the LRP1 mice are more susceptible to this um, infection after immunization. So they're less able to mount uh, an adaptive immune response to salmonella. So what this has told us is that serum amyloid A um, is an essential piece in understanding how uh, retinol is delivered to the gut adaptive immune system. So serum amyloid A binds to retinol that comes in from the diet, and it mobilizes this retinol from gut epithelial cells to myeloid cells, um, again, dendritic cells and macrophages, that express its receptor LRP1 and sort of lurk beneath the surface um, of the gut epithelium. So this allows these myeloid cells to acquire retinol for enzymatic conversion to retinoic acid, um, which they do uh, upon migrating to, um, to mesenteric lymph nodes where developing uh, T, uh, at least developing T cells hang out. Um, and their interaction, they pass this retinoic acid to, um, uh, to, to developing T cells, and this induces them to become uh, functional adaptive immune cells and migrate uh, back to the intestine to fight infection. So this helps explain mechanistically how retinol is mobilized from epithelial cells to the gut immune system. What I think is actually quite important and which we're working on testing formally now is that this suggests that a, a mechanism by which the microbiota regulates adaptive immunity is to regulate the flow of vitamin A from uh, the gut epithelium into the immune system because we know that the microbiota is required to induce SAA expression. Um, so our hypothesis is that this uh, mechanism is required for the microbiota to induce IgA and to induce um, CD4 uh, positive T cell homing um, in the gut, which we know it does. So we're uh, working on um, formally uh, testing these ideas. So, uh, so to sort of link back to our earlier work on the innate immune system, what we know now is that there's a microbiota inducible gene expression program um, in the intestinal epithelium that, that has many components. Um, as I said earlier, uh, one of the things the microbiota induces in epithelial cells are um, antimicrobial proteins such as Reg3 gamma and Realm beta and several others. And these help to sort of keep things uh, from crossing the epithelial barrier. But at the same time that this is happening, SAAs are being uh, upregulated as well. And so uh, these antimicrobial proteins we think of as being on the, the very front line. Um, and uh, um, SAAs we think are more radioing for backup from uh, the, um, the intestinal adaptive immune system. So you have frontline defense and then you have um, radioing for backup help from, from adaptive immunity that's all sort of encoded in this um, epithelial gene expression program. So um, I'm actually gonna stop there. We're, um, that, the last slide was to indicate we are working uh, on um, uh, the role of uh, SAAs in other aspects of immunity, including lung immunity and systemic immunity. And we have some very interesting stories brewing there, but I'll go ahead and stop there and point out the people that uh, did uh, most of the work that I talked about. So this is my wonderful lab. Um, this is actually kind of an outdated picture, but it shows Yi Ji Bang. She was uh, the um, postdoc who did um, all of the work on SAA and its interaction with LRP1. Um, and uh, I also wanted to point out Han Hu, who was an excellent 
um, structural biologist who was in my lab, um, and he did the structure of um, retinol bound to SAA, which was actually a really difficult uh, structural biology project to do. Both of them now uh, run their own labs. EAG is back in South Korea and Han is back in China. So I'm sure you'll be seeing really great things from their labs very soon. Um, and then these are the folks that uh, paid for all of our work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Laura. That was um, so wonderful. I'm sure um, so many of our listeners just really enjoyed that and have so many questions for you, which everybody can do by going to our Twitter. Um, Laura's um, going to use her own account, uh, her lab's account to um, answer your questions. We'll be doing so, um, keeping an eye on that for the next couple of weeks for anybody watching at a later date on YouTube. So um, go to our Global Immun Immunotalks account, find the tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Laura Hoover here, and then reply to that tweet mentioning um, the hashtag and then um, Laura will respond to the questions that you have. So again, Laura, thank you so much for um, giving a global immune talk to everybody today. Um, reminding everybody to tune in next week, we'll have Yardenia Samuels from the Weizmann Institute joining us. And we'll hope that you'll join us then. Um, see you next time. Thank you so much.